Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is an honor to be promoted to a, to a professor and to be asked to deliver a lecture like this to your colleagues, uh, your peers, your students, and friends and family. And I thank you for coming here this afternoon, especially on such a nice afternoon outside. Uh, I will start the lecture by first putting the subject of my research into context. What is the soil in terms of, sort of geotechnical engineering and more broadly civil engineering uh, uh, construction? Well, our structures rest on soil via different foundation systems. Uh, they're constructed in the soil, like tunnels and deep excavations, or they can be constructed from the soil, uh, like earth dams and infrastructure embankments. So what are the challenges that are here on the way? Where well, our principal interest is to uh, understand the soil's capacity to sustain load and to understand the magnitudes of resulting deformations so that we don't get excessive damages and failures. The soil in its, own, in its nature being, being a natural material is very variable. It has complex geological history in some cases, and it's of different scale. So for us, soil is anything starting from a gravel, uh, rock, uh, uh, cobbles, sand, going down to silt and uh, clay. And while the first two, uh, so we can see the grains with the naked, uh, naked eye, the second two, the latter two, uh, we need some sort of magnifying glass, uh, most likely a very strong microscope to be even able to identify a particle. Furthermore, we have a diversity in soil behavior. If you take a sand, and I'm sure many of us have tried just to pour uh, a dry sand, and it always takes a shape of a conical hip, and this hip is stable uh, at some angle that is usually 30, 35, 40 degrees, uh, whatever you do with the dry sand, it will always take that stable shape. However, we go then to the beach, and the sand is a little bit wet, and we've uh, filled the bucket, bucket with sand and turned it over, and we get another heap which has much steeper sides, and that is stable as well. Similarly, the clay, uh, we may be able to excavate almost a vertical uh, slope in a clay, and that will be stable. But then we go further down the road, and in a very gentle slope, we have a failure. So what are the causes for these uh, different differences in, in behavior? Well, soil is multi-phase material to start with. We have solid particles as a, as a, as a first uh, uh, ingredient, and then we have some voids or pores in between those particles, which could be filled with air completely, and in that case we have a dry soil, so that is our dry sand, or they can be filled with water, and we have a fully saturated soil. When we talk about stress in a soil, we don't have just a single stress uh, mark here, it's like sigma, we have an effective stress component that is taken by the soil skeleton, by these solid particles, and we have a pressure in the pores, in the, in the pore water, as sort of two components of the, of the stress in soil. So that is a further complication when we try to do our calculations. And to make better, even more complicated, the pores may be actually half or partially filled with water, and partially with air, in which case we have an unsaturated soil. Um, and on top of everything, all of these phases interact with each other, and they affect the overall uh, response of the soil. Uh, furthermore, when we try to understand soil response to uh, applied load, uh, we may do that uh, to start with taking a, a piece of soil and test it in the laboratory in a typical three-axial testing equipment, and as a result, we get some uh, stress strain curves here, different curves mark different, tape, uh, different tests and conditions of those tests. But the primary uh, uh, message from this picture is that everything is highly nonlinear. And because of this, um, we need advanced 
for all this interaction, we need first advanced experimental tools to understand the complexities of soil behavior. And then we need advanced computational tools uh, in the shape of numerical methods to be able to uh, uh, perform our calculations realistically and uh, develop appropriate design approaches. Trying to put all of this in an analytical approach is practically impossible uh, <clears throat> because there's so many intricacies and that is where, where numerical uh, methods uh, uh, do come in. So that is where my expertise has developed in the past 20 years in developing numerical methods, uh, although I have done and I still uh, sort of supervise research in the laboratory. Uh, as Nick has already introduced it, I do work with a bespoke software EQIP, which uh, has adopted a finite element method of analysis, and it's being developed through uh, PhD research and practical applications. Uh, the software originates with my colleague, uh, Professor David Potts, some 30 odd years ago, at the time when he started to develop his career at Imperial. And over the past 20 years that I have been involved with the code, um, there have been sort of three uh, major extensions and developments in ICFEB, which uh, conveniently form uh, my, my talk uh, today. Uh, so soil dynamics, which is the shaken part of my talk, unsaturated soils, which are clearly dehydrated, and then the latest red-hot developments of thermal soil behavior. <coughs> so just briefly to, to introduce what it is that we do in numerical analysis. Um, we have, in reality, so when we, when we when need to design something, we need a design brief. We know what the structure roughly looks like. We have some geometry. And we have some information on the soil uh, on which everything is being constructed. And now, with analysis, we need to idealize this. And uh, in finite elements, we need to perform some geometric discretization. Uh, in, from soil investigation, we need to think about modeling the material behavior. And design brief, whether we construct or excavate something or do something else, defines uh, the so-called boundary conditions. And all of this goes together into uh, a numerical solver that the computer will do something with, and we, we are going to get a result, which is a prediction of what might be happening. But all of this be, being sketched like this needs to be, needs to be uh, uh, translated into mathematical form. So here, just to take an example of, of how all of this works, a very simple example of, of showing here uh, a slab um, uh, on the on a, on a, on a, uh, top of the soil. And design brief here would be finding the load that this slab can take on this soil. Now, for something simple like this, we would not uh, um, uh, necessarily do a finite element analysis, but it is convenient just to, to show an example. So if I take, for simplicity, uh, a vertical cross-section through uh, this slab and the soil underneath, what we have is this geometry uh, and ground conditions. So we have foundation slab, and we may have several soil layers in depth. Um, and this is what we need to find out. What is the, the magnitude of the building load on this soil? So our idealization will start by discretizing the geometry. Uh, and with the finite element method, this discretization is done with the number of, of smaller elements. Here, very simply, they are, they are rectangular, but they can be uh, distorted uh, quadrilateral elements or triangles in 2D conditions or more complicated in 3D uh, uh, conditions. And that is our discretization of geometry. So we end up having that finite element mesh, uh, and we have a number of elements uh, um, that belong to each of these soil layers. So we may then have a soil uh, material model for each of these uh, independent layers. We may also have to have a, a model for concrete. And we then have uh, a boundary condition. In this case, will be a stress boundary condition that comes from uh, needing to find out what is the, the maximum load on this, on this slab. And this is what, what then uh, we are going to analyze and get the result. So the question is now, how is this uh, 
translated into mathematical form to give us uh, required solutions. Well, the starting point is this little element, a finite element, which is characterized by uh, some nodal points. And if this element is loaded, it can deform. So nod nodal points can move, which means that there are some displacements, that, that they have some displacement components in them. And this deformation results only from that so effective part of the, of, of the stress that, that we wrote earlier that is passed through the soil skeleton. And this gives us a mechanical part of soil behavior. And when we uh, apply uh, the required um, variational principles and everything else, we can then derive the uh, principal finite element be uh, equation for mechanical behavior of saturated soils, where this matrix K comes from uh, material modeling, so it has components of, of how the soil skeleton behaves. This here are boundary conditions, so the, the applied load, and then these are these nodal displacements that we have to solve for. So that is the uh, solid uh, part of the, of the uh, soil behavior. Clearly, then, what happens in the pores, how we deal with that? Well, we add uh, a pore water pressure as an uh, unknown component at these same nodes, uh, and this represents the, what is happening in the pore space and gives us the hydraulic part of soil behavior. And then, again, when we, when we uh, apply the required uh, developments of, all this, of this system, we have now a finite element equation for a hydromechanical uh, behavior of saturated soils. And this is now, obviously, the equation has changed the two uh, 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 quantities that we are looking for to solve displacements and pore pressures. Uh, the um, soil skeleton part, and I'm sorry, this here should have, uh, there is uh, some shading here that uh, has not come out here, so K and D and R were there in the soil skeleton, so that is from the, from the previous development. And uh, the addition now is uh, we have soil permeability that we have to think about for water flowing in the soil, poor water pressure, and water flow on the right-hand side. And the really tricky bit is, is uh, uh, this uh, matrices here that are uh, off-diagonal terms, which are what we call coupling matrices uh, which describe the interaction between the water and the solid phases. And this is usually where the, the biggest problems are in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, numerical formulation, uh, finding out the right parameters to describe this, uh, this uh, interaction. So this is where, where I came in, uh, uh, in the development of uh, uh, computational methods uh, uh, in geotechnic section. And this now conveniently um, sets me on to talk a little bit about uh, soil dynamics and what we can do with this particular development. So why developing the, the uh, dynamic part of, of the numerical approach? Well, clearly the applications are numerous, um, uh, from high-speed rail and wave and wind loading of offshore structures all the way to uh, earthquake engineering probably being the, the most obvious one. Uh, what is happening here? What we now need to worry about in addition to what we have done so far in our numerical formulation, just taking here schematically an example of what is happening in an earthquake, we have somewhere deep in the ground an earthquake is uh, um, <clears throat> generated by a sudden uh, movement across uh, a fault plane uh, between various rocks. And this uh, releases some energy deep in the ground that then sends a um, seismic wave through the, through, the, through the soil all the way through the ground surface. And this wave shakes the soil, and that is what uh, gives us a problem and causes, causes uh, a lot of damage. And uh, because of this shaking, if we look at, uh, at a typical uh, um, ground motion record uh, for the wave passing through the soil, which is usually expressed as acceleration versus time, um, it looks like lots of, sort of cyclic loading um, uh, 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 steps uh, for this wave to get from its, its uh, origination, from, from its uh, um, uh, uh, origin all the way to, to the end of shaking. 
So what do we now have to consider in our governing finite element equations? Well, we have to uh, consider this uh, uh, equation of motion for so solid uh, fluid uh, mixture. So that is where, where our formulation was left uh, a few slides before. And uh, this is an equation now uh, for the, for the um, uh, static, for the, for the uh, sorry, um, uh, solid fluid mixture. Again, uh, here some shading should appear that highlights the previous uh, static HM formulation. So K, KD equals to delta R plus this. So that was the static part. So now, in addition, we, we have some nodal velocities. We have some nodal <laughs> accelerations. Uh, uh, we have inertia uh, to worry about and some viscous damping. In addition, we, because of this cyclic loading, there is going to be some dissipation, energy dissipation within the soil. And because of the time uh, uh, that now appears in, 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 the, um, uh, in this discretization, we need to have a very uh, accurate uh, time discretization scheme to uh, enable us to um, put all of this together and derive uh, appropriate dynamic hydromechanic uh, formulation uh, for saturated soils. And this here now looks, again, a similar matrix to, to the one before, but with obvious changes. The K matrix is different, in the first instance, because K matrix now has to take account of all these additions here. Uh, the, uh, it is also a non-symmetric matrix, because the off-diagonal terms are now not symmetric. And there are uh, various coefficients here that appear for a uh, time discretization scheme. Uh, some fluid solid interaction due to shaking uh, is there, and also compressibility of the pore fluid. So that is the formulation that we, that we uh, uh, develop. And a particular aspect of dynamic uh, problem that I uh, want to briefly examine here is a liquefaction, because that is one of the, the disastrous consequences of earthquakes. And it's also numerically the most notorious um, um, phenomenon to capture and to reproduce accurately. And briefly, again, to just remind ourselves what is liquefaction, uh, uh, why, why it appears. Um, it, we need a saturated granular sediment for liquefaction to, to take place. So some mixture of sands and silts. It is unlikely to, to happen in, in clays. And if you look at, uh, at uh, so a package of, uh, let's say, some sand particles, and we think of uh, um, something applied on top of that uh, uh, package, the, the load um, that is applied externally is transferred through this uh, system via these contact forces, bet uh, contacts between the particles. So that is, again, that effective part of, of, our, of our stress in the soil. And the shear wave, seismic wave, now comes in, and its nature is to, to shake everything. Uh, and therefore, it causes, um, it causes um, buildup of pore pressures. So there's some, uh, the, the pore space now uh, gets uh, uh, higher uh, pressures. And at a stage when the, um, uh, this excess pore pressure is equal to the effective stress there that was, that was acting in the contact before, so this ratio here is equal to 1, uh, we have an onset of liquefaction. Because we have lost the contact, the, the zero stress we have in the, in the soil skeleton, the particle, the, the sand particles now float in the, in the water, and we have one fluidized mixture. So there is no more um, um, a support to transfer the load from the top, and the usual consequences of liquefaction that we see after earthquake are essentially the structures and objects, like the car here, sinking in this, in this fluidized granular deposit. So what would be then the objective of, uh, of uh, a, a numerical analysis or liquefaction analysis uh, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, numerical applications? Well, we first, we would like to predict, to be able to predict whether liquefaction will occur in a given deposit what would be a depth of the liquefied layer, and what would be the magnitude of settlement. So that we can then go away and think about the likely uh, um, 
uh, mitigation measures that uh, one may apply uh, to prevent uh, a disaster from happening. Very important part now in, in, the, in the whole process would be mechanical modeling of sand. Because what we want to do, we want, be, we want to be able to uh, have a, a constitutive model that can account for these variations in density of a sense of the, the, the variations of, of uh, the, the uh, packing of the sand. And uh, the model that we have ad adopted and further developed uh, in the code is uh, a form of a bounding surface plasticity model which very simply is formulated within the critical state modeling framework for uh, 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 soil constitutive models. And it has three interactive surfaces at large deformations, uh, uh, obviously critical state surface, uh, bounding surface for uh, controlling peak strength, and the latency surface for controlling um, the plastic volumetric strengths and so-called phase transformation. And with a model like this, we can reproduce some, uh, uh, what we see in the experiments as a, as a typical effective stress path for a, a dense sand and a typical uh, effective stress path for a loose sand. Now, in terms of analysis, an example that, that uh, uh, we've taken here is a model test that reproduces liquefaction because you will appreciate that Controlling, having a controlled field experiment uh, for an event like this would be quite difficult because of the, of the sheer scale and uh, with everything else that is happening in earthquakes. So what normally we do for, for uh, uh, cases like this, we resort to um, having a controlled small scale test where we can measure uh, various parameters uh, that are of interest for a particular problem. And this... Uh, VELAX project was uh, um, um, designed specifically for that purpose in the 90s by a number of uh, uh, American universities who got together and decided to uh, reproduce in a centrifuge physical test a number of uh, experiments that introduce, uh, that, that uh, um, reproduce simulation, uh, uh, liquefaction. And the, the VELAX essentially stands for verification of liquefaction analysis uh, from centrifuge studies. And those centrifuge experiments then uh, were passed to uh, uh, people who do computational analysis to essentially validate and, and check their, their numerical models. And we are here, we have taken a VELAX model one for our analysis, which essentially is a, a, a box, a centrifuge box filled with um, Nevada sand at uh, um, so loose sand relative density of 40%. Uh, here, uh, this is the size of the box, 20 centimeter deep and about 45 centimeter wide and uh, also in the, in the out of plane direction. Uh, the um, centrifuge acceleration that was applied to this test was 50 G, which means that in reality, this, uh, this uh, uh, experiment, experiment reproduces liquefaction in a deposit, sand deposit that is 10 meters uh, deep. And they um, instrumented this with a number of uh, uh, piezometers, which would measure the, the uh, changes of pore pressure in the, in the um, uh, pore space, a uh, number of uh, um, accelerometers to record the ground shaking or uh, shaking of this, uh, of this sand and then some um, uh, LVDTs to measure the settlements on the, on the surface of this sand. And this was all shaken at a base uh, with some prescribed um, uh, uh, 12 seconds uh, cyclic loading. The numerical analysis that we here perform is a coupled hydromechanical analysis. Uh, our Bounding surface model is calibrated thoroughly on uh, this Nevada sand because there was lots of uh, test data, uh, laboratory data on this sand available for calibration of the mechanical model. The permeability model here, the permeability was considered very simply as a constant permeability, which in the, in the box itself was 6.6 .6 e to minus 5 meters per second, 
but in the, in the prototype, in the real deposit, this translates into 3.3 times e to minus 3 meters per second. And I will now show the results from, the, from, from analysis, only a few of, of the results, in, in a sense of the, of the um, uh, prototype dimensions. So what we are plotting here is um, uh, the um, uh, development of excess pore water pressures at these four uh, measuring points. Uh, and the horizontal axis, we have time in seconds. And in addition to, to, to uh, the experimental records, we also have this RU equal to one uh, line uh, in e at each of these depths, which essentially uh, denotes the level or the, the um, uh, magnitude of the pore pressure at which liquefaction conditions are achieved. So uh, the excess pore pressure of a sigma V at that level equals to one. And what we see from the experiment is that the, the buildup of, so this is start of shaking and 12.5 seconds is the end of, of shaking uh, of, the, of, the, of the ground motion. Uh, we see a very rapid buildup of pore pressure in the sort of top part of the deposit, reaching very quickly the liquefaction condition and obviously liquefying. The, uh, in the middle, 5.2 uh, meter depth, so this is, as I said, this is a depth of the, of the real deposit, uh, of the, oh, sorry, the prototype deposit. We have much slower buildup of pore pressures, but still reaches liquefaction conditions, whereas the, the lowest measuring point uh, uh, shows that the excess pore water pressure there has not reached the liquefaction conditions. So what we know from, from looking at, uh, at these results is that clearly, the, the depth of, liquef of liquefied layer is somewhere between 5.2 and 7.8 meters. But we don't know from these results where exactly it is. So what we can then uh, 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 infer from here by, looking, by uh, interrogating further these results, uh, we see that dissipation of excess pore pressures uh, in the uh, lower part in the middle of these deposits deposit starts pretty much immediately after the end of, of the shaking period, whereas in the upper part, um, it starts, it is delayed. It starts much later than, than, than the end of, uh, end of shaking. And this is essentially associated with uh, this being more or less one-dimensional flow, the water uh, uh, coming upwards and feeding the, the top layers, but also and once the shaking stops, we start to get resedimentation re of, of particles. Everything would start to, to uh, sort of uh, uh, go, go back to normal and solidify again. So what we can then associate with the start of uh, dissipation of excess pore pressures is the, the progression of this solidification front. And clearly, it has to start from the bottom because the particles settle on top of the undisturbed deposit. And it uh, uh, progresses to uh, the surface of the deposit with a constant velocity. So therefore, it means if we now uh, pick up these end points and we look at the depth, at depth versus time a diagram, uh, we have constant velocity. So this is a linear uh, relationship. And where this line intersects our line of the end of shaking, we estimate where the, the uh, depth of the uh, uh, liquefied layer is, and that turns out to be 5.24 meters. We then obviously perform our analysis and we, we get similar results out of it, and we superimpose them on this uh, uh, experiment. And what we see here from our analysis looking at this buildup of pore pressures, uh, we see that actually what we have predicted is that. Um, um, the, the depth of liquefied layer is much, uh, much deeper. Uh, somewhere between, obviously, 7.8 and the, and the base of, of, uh, of the deposit, which is 10 meters. Uh, so if you apply a similar procedure as we've done for the experiment, so this is the, the uh, end of, of uh, um, sorry, th this uh, 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 points are the start of dissipation of of excess pore pressures. We get here uh, intersection with, the, with our timeline, 
and we estimate that the depth of the liquefied layer predicted is eight meters, which clearly is, uh, is uh, uh, quite a bit of an overprediction. So what else we can look at? We can look at, at the settlement uh, of that top uh, of, the, of the surface of the, of the deposit. And we see here settlement versus time, uh, obviously the development of, of settlement uh, up to the end of shaking. And then when it all stops, it just creeps up a bit more before it stabilizes. Uh, but our analysis predicts much smaller uh, overall settlement. And this may sound like a contradiction that we have predicted a deeper liquefied layer, but smaller settlement. But it's not really a contradiction. Um, because we need to understand what is the cause for this discrepancy. And we can show, uh, we have done so, that actually this has nothing to do and it's not a consequence of the uh, mechanical model and what the mechanical model does. It is a consequence of the permeability model. Because what happens once the liquefaction occurs, permeability doesn't stay constant, as we've taken in the, in the, in the analysis it actually increases because that loss of contact that we sketched on earlier slides means that water can essentially go through those channels now because there is no resistance there any longer and that increases the, the permeability in the liquefied layer. So the first thing now if we repeat our analysis uh, would be to just simply uh, uh, multiply our initial permeability by uh, some large numbers, maybe increase it twice, four times, ten times, uh, to actually prove that uh, this is what is likely uh, the problem. And we see that the uh, increased permeability clearly increases surface settlement. But we are doing this arbitrarily. Uh, 10k naught uh, sort of plots closer to the experimental result. But the problem is that we are applying this to the whole deposit. And the, uh, the, the permeability really changes only in the liquefied part of the deposit. Uh, the other problem is if we now look at the thickness of the liquefied layer, we started here with our initial permeability uh, predicting eight meters. Uh, obviously, uh, with the increased permeability, that thickness reduces. But somewhere here, where we are close to the experimental result, this is still then too, too, too uh, uh, low thickness of that liquefied layer. So that is not quite satisfactory. So indeed, if we actually take the experiment itself and we interrogate all the measurements in the liquefied part of the deposit, we can uh, uh, see what is happening with the permeability, uh, plotted here as uh, uh, permeability at any instance of time, normalized by that constant initial permeability that we originally started with. And we see that it's essentially uh, uh, it increases very quickly at the beginning of shaking and then gradually reduces and at the end of shaking it uh, goes down rapidly but not back to a ratio of one where we started from but now the deposit has densified so uh, this ratio is slightly smaller than one. And in the literature one will find that uh, uh, people have developed uh, the variable permeability models uh, adopting some sort of variation like this in terms of time. But we looked at this and we thought that the time is really uh, not a physical property of the sand itself, and it would be much better if we were to develop a permeability model that is related to this hydromechanical interaction within the liquefied deposit. And uh, we proposed a model uh, that essentially will uh, um, uh, vary the permeability in terms of this uh, excess water pressure ratio RU because that is what, is what is happening, what is causing the liquefaction. When this RU starts to shoot off and get closer to one, that is when permeability starts to change quite rapidly. And with a model like this, and so the, the, the advantage of this uh, is that we, we are uh, not then changing permeability arbitrarily in the non-liquefied deposits. So we are allowing it to, to uh, vary spatially and also to depend on that, on that excess pool water pressure, which is what, is what is causing the liquefaction. 
And if we now repeat our analysis with this model in, uh, we, are, we are then uh, obtaining a result where the uh, uh, prediction of settlement is now much more satisfactory in terms of both developing the settlement during the, the shaking and then the, the final magnitude. And also the, the liquefaction front is now predicted properly. So, so where do we now go with this? Having this tool, we are now on the right track to go and examine these various mitigation measures that may apply to different uh, uh, granular deposits and also that may apply to, to, to different ground motions because uh, 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 this is another uh, variable in the whole story about the liquefaction. So I will leave now saturated soils for a while back and then I will, I will talk about unsaturated uh, uh, developments uh, and what are the challenges there and what we can do there. So the application of unsaturated soils, the, the most the wide perception is that uh, unsaturated soils exist uh, uh, in sort of arid and dry regions, but actually um, uh, the truth is that two-thirds of all natural deposits in the surface part are unsaturated. Plus, all the compacted soils that form uh, our uh, earth dams, flood embankments, barriers for, for waste uh, disposal being uh, uh, constructed of a compacted material, they're all unsaturated uh, to start with. So the applications are obviously uh, uh, quite important for, uh, for uh, geotechnical engineering. So what is happening here? What is, what is uh, uh, now uh, challenging our uh, numerical formulation? So the, the, if you look at the, uh, the um, so element of soil uh, in unsaturated conditions, as we said before, we have pores which are partly filled with air and partly with water. And if we take um, a, a, a particle contact with some uh, contact water uh, uh, in between and uh, um, just try to understand what is, what is happening there, uh, we have some air pressure uh, on these two sides of the water and we have some water pressure in that, uh, um, uh, that small uh, part of, of, of water. And this develops uh, in between the two particles and this develops uh, a strong surface uh, menisci with some uh, potentially high tensile uh, forces that are keeping this whole thing together. And uh, this um, tensile force we term a suction. And that is the um, parameter which gives stability to our sand castle uh, that we make from the wet sand on the beach. So that those little uh, bits of water in between the sand particles. But then when this uh, air space gets flooded, uh, gets rehydrated, um, the suction is destroyed and uh, when the tide comes in, our water, uh, our, our sand castle um, falls apart. So the governing finite element equations now, this, this suction bit that is, that is very important, uh, must come into play and that now complicates uh, uh, the, the formulation further because we must have now two independent stress variables. We must have a suction as a difference between poor air and poor water uh, pressure. And we now talk about some net stress as a uh, difference between our total stress and the poor air uh, pr uh, pr pressure. And our, and our constitutive and, and hydraulic modeling needs to develop further because in our mechanical models, we now need to have uh, uh, models that can, that can account for suction in the soil, which means that we have some tensile capacity in the soil, which in most, uh, uh, okay, most situations of saturated soils, we have no tensile capacity in the soil. Uh, our permeability also has to, develop, has to depend on, on suction uh, in some nonlinear manner. So saturated permeability usually decreases with increased suction. And this degree of saturation, um, uh, so that is some sort of measure of the ability of soil to retain uh, water, also depends on suction. And uh, it is, to complicate things even further, it's of hysteretic nature. So whether we dry the soil or wet the soil, 
uh, we get two different parts. So with all of this, we now get uh, a, a different set of equations for hydromechanical behavior of unsaturated soils, where still we have the uh, remnants of, uh, of the previous so purely mechanical uh, uh, part and some parts of the, of the saturated part. But we now have parameters uh, like this one here that controls the uh, effect of air in the pore space. And we have uh, some uh, contribution here in our permeability part of the, of the formulation, uh, which uh, controls, which comes from the water retention control. So again, a particular application that I would like to look here with this formulation now is related to uh, uh, mud slides, which are essentially uh, slope instabilities uh, um, caused by heavy rainfall. And again, we're used to seeing this in uh, so places like Hong Kong or, uh, or uh, uh, Central and South America, where again, there, there's, there are large variations in temperature, so everything gets dry uh, in one part of the year, and then heavy rainfall comes and uh, washes everything away from the, from the top of the hill, uh, destroying the, the lives and, and, and uh, um, uh, houses somewhere at the bottom of the hill. But we see this also in Europe, which is meant to be uh, uh, a wet so part of the world. Um, and particularly, uh, we're talking here about um, uh, slopes that uh, have been created by deposition of volcanic ash. So the, these are pyroclastic slopes in the uh, Campania region in Italy around Vesuvius. Uh, and uh, this uh, picture here shows uh, a particular area of uh, uh, villages of Sarno and Quindici, which was in May uh, 1998, uh, had a catastrophic uh, uh, mudslide coming from somewhere up the slope here and uh, engulfing, engulfing these villages. And um, this sort of washout from the, from the slopes leaves some really uh, sort of nasty scars because uh, everything is washed often down to the bedrock uh, um, when, when these things happen. And we happened to go to take our master's students um, three years later after, after this event to, uh, on a field trip in Italy, and we visited these sites. Um, here, standing above the, uh, uh, at the bottom of the, of the, of the slope, above the, the village of, uh, of Quindici, here is a, a group of, of MSc students, and I'm standing obviously in the back taking pictures. And some of you may, may be able to recognize that this individual here this is uh, Professor Potts studying local geology, obviously, and thinking about it all and how to, how to model it. And if you go down further into the village, we've seen the, the, the uh, still three years later, the uh, um, still traces on houses that obviously are not inhabited any longer, we see how high this flow of mud uh, uh, came into the village. Uh, another picture just um, showed that essentially there was no way of, of uh, uh, surviving this if, if you were caught in it. So the numerical analysis here that we're talking about is going to be numerical analysis of pyroclastic slopes. The ground conditions, as I, as I mentioned, uh, have been created by the, the presence of the Vesuvius uh, volcano, uh, which uh, unfortunately has, uh, has explosive eruptions. Um, the last eruption was in 1944, which was uh, um, uh, taken uh, um, by some uh, B-52 uh, bombers that were from the American air base that were flying around. And the, um, these uh, explosive eruptions, um, not all of them have been in history explosive, but those main ones uh, that have happened uh, over the two millennia, essentially, uh, have been such to um, uh, send the, the ash, the volcanic ash, flying around to distances of 30, 40 kilometers away. So that is why they, are, they reach so far in these slopes. And uh, um, uh, this ash in various uh, uh, eruptions is deposited on top of the uh, 
very firm bedrock, limestone, and uh, um, this depositional stages have created some eight distinct layers, so there's still difference between them, but you can see that the whole thickness of this ash and pumice on top of lime scale is very small, it's only five to six meters. And it is, these are in, uh, in uh, deposited and they're there in their um, initial state as unsaturated soils with a degree of saturation of only uh, 60 to 70 degrees, 70 percent. And uh, um, our colleagues at the University of Naples uh, in 2006 decided to uh, undertake a research program to uh, sort of investigate a uh, little bit better these uh, deposits and to try to uh, uh, do some calculations about these. And that is where we got involved. So they established, so this is the site that they chose, which was uh, close to some uh, uh, ancient uh, historic landslides. But uh, the, the whole area is little, littered literally with hundreds of smaller uh, landslides um, that are happening uh, due to uh, sort of rainfall infiltration in the slopes. And they did a thorough characterization of all eight uh, uh, these pyroclastic layers through laboratory and field testing. And they monitored for a period of one year the rainfall and evapore uh, transpiration on the slopes. And uh, um, uh, just to show what type of uh, material this ash and pumice has become uh, uh, after, after uh, being deposited there, this is a, um, on the horizontal axis we have a particle size and on the vertical axis the percentage of those particles within uh, uh, the deposit. So mainly we are talking about sands, about 50% of sands and 50% of silt. So uh, uh, deposited on, on, on top of uh, uh, limestone. Now, what is important here, because uh, these uh, failures are induced by rainfall infiltration, um, the very important uh, part of, of the whole behavior to characterize is really the hydraulic behavior. In terms of shearing resistance, these soils have angle of shearing resistance of 37, 40 degrees. So they're quite strong in that sense, but that is not what governs the stability. It is really this interplay of, of, of suction and rainfall that is, that is important. And uh, they've, uh, they've measured uh, permeability. So here showing just the, the sort of average um, um, permeability and water retention for shallower layers and for deeper layers. But we see that even with a, just a, up to 100 kPa, change of suction, which really is not much in, 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 uh, in, in soil, uh, we have several orders of, of difference decrease in permeability. And uh, uh, the water retention behavior, we said that these uh, um, slopes are at 60-70% initial, initial uh, degree of saturation, so there is only about 10 kPa of suction in them. So you don't need much water inside to destroy that suction. And the uh, rainfall record over, over one year uh, shows that uh, um, some maximum uh, rainfall could be 70, as high as 70 millimeters per day, more average about 35 millimeters per day, and then in the dry season uh, is obviously more uh, dominant evapotranspiration rather than, rather than rainfall. So in our finite element analysis now, what we are going to do is to, first of all, uh, um, simulate the construction, or the deposition of this pumice and an ash on top of limestone. Uh, so we are constructing these layers with some uh, estimated initial suction, because that is what we want to, to achieve. Um, so these are the, uh, all the pyroclastic layers. And then once we have done that, we are going to apply this uh, uh, a yearly cycle of rainfall, uh, uh, evaporation, which is the loss of moisture from the ground surface, and transpiration, which is a loss of moisture through the leaves of the vegetation. But these leaves, really, they take water, the roots take water from the, from the, from the ground and then pass it on to the leaves to, to evaporate. And both of these functions, evaporation and transpiration, are also nonlinear function functions of, uh, of suction. 
So it's all extremely involved in terms of the numerical solution. So uh, looking at some results briefly, um, uh, first of all, looking at the initial pore water pressure in the slope, um, uh, we want to establish that correctly to start from, from, uh, from the right initial state. So here, uh, just point out, we are, we are going to monitor uh, this cross section here uh, in the middle of the slope, but there was the device in Naples, they had various monitoring points up and down the slope. Uh, these are the different layers in these five meters of, of soil. Uh, and we start um, our initial suction profile, uh, obviously very, uh, in very good agreement with the, with the measured suction uh, on site. And we then apply this uh, annual cycle of uh, rainfall um, and evapotranspiration from November 2006 <coughs> to uh, uh, November 2007, and we monitor this change in suction. And first of all, we look what is happening in depth, so about middle of the, of the deposit, two and a half meter depth. We can see that actually the suction there doesn't change very much throughout the year. Maybe in this uh, um, dry season increases slightly to about 30 kPa, but we are, we are reproducing uh, this whole thing very, very accurately. And in the surface uh, uh, deposit uh, at about 0.5 meter depth, we have obviously quite a steady suction in the wet season. And then in the dry season, we have uh, quite an increase in suction. And this is the, the, the important thing here, as I said, is really this interaction, this, this surface layer is very important to, to capture, to be sensitive enough for rainfall and, uh, and any evaporation. And I'm here um, um, cho chosen just a couple of snapshots of how our analysis was tuned to, to reproduce this accurately. So this is where we start uh, in, uh, November, uh, uh, in November 2006. And then we have the next reading was taken 25th November uh, uh, 2006. So this has come after some uh, heavy rainfall. These uh, uh, points here are uh, daily records. So we have 25th comes a couple of days after really intensive rainfall. And this superficial layer, clearly the, the rain has destroyed a part of suction. So we have a reduction here. But then um, there was about a week, 10 days of fairly dry period in, in November. So this suction is gone back up. So from 10 here to 15 and down here. And then the, the this, uh, a month of December was fairly wet, so suction is again destroyed and uh, goes back to, to a lower value in that superficial la layer. So this is just for the first couple of months of, of, of that year, and that is what we are reproducing uh, throughout, throughout the year. So very uh, uh, sensitive uh, uh, analysis capturing all of this happening. So, the whole purpose, having then uh, uh, developed a numerical model that can deal with all of this, was to examine a number of things here. Uh, first of all, the effect of rainfall intensity, the initial conditions before uh, intensive rainfall, whether, whether it's the same if the rain comes in the wet season or it comes in the dry season. Uh, what is the effect of changing any mechanical behavior of the soil, which wasn't really great because it's not really uh, driven by the mechanical behavior, and uh, what is the effect of changing hydraulic characterization of the soil. And again, just a couple of snapshots of the results. Uh, the first thing that we have done here is to uh, uh, apply a high rainfall intensity of 70 millimeters per day for five days, because this is what caused that r catastrophic event in 1998. The rain, was, the rain was intensive from 1st to 5th of May, and the failure of the slope, the mudslide mud, mud happened uh, between the 4th and 5th of May. So with our analysis, this is what we are reproducing. This, this, vector, this uh, graph here shows the vectors of uh, uh, ground movement in the slope, and uh, uh, we see that essentially the whole of the slope is mobilized uh, in terms of uh, uh, stability, 
uh, at the end of this, uh, this uh, five-day rainfall. So uh, you can imagine then how much volume of soil has gone down the slope. Uh, it is an overall slope failure, and it is about one to one and a half meter deep uh, 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 throughout the slope. But it's also uh, important, the, the further things that we are investigating, that it was started in the top of this part of the slope after the first three days of this rainfall, and then gradually, after the fourth day, it started to pick up down the slope. So it is not something that happens, uh, uh, happened uh, immediately, but it was developing over a period of time. And then, uh, uh, just another snapshot to finish with this, uh, we applied uh, a same volume of rain, 350 millimeters, but we applied this over 10 days with 35 millimeters a day. And there, the, the failure was not that catastrophic. It was more local uh, in the top part of the slope because over 10 days, there was time for, for rain, essentially, to, for water to infiltrate into deeper layers and to make this more stable and <coughs> the rest of the slope not so much. And this is now four to four and a half meter depth. So where we are going with all of this is really uh, in this, we, being able to, to understand the, the whole hydromechanics of these slopes to go now into a risk analysis, which essentially uh, uh, relies on these fragility curves that would simply uh, give a, a, a probability of failure occurring based on the uh, amount of rainfall that has come on the slope. And our objective here is to uh, make those fragility curves more accurate because it is not just the volume of, of, of water that has come down, but to relate this also to more uh, 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 fundamentally uh, uh, appropriate hydromechanical properties of, of a slope and the soil in the slope. So with this, I then come to the last part of my talk, which is really the red hot bit, because this is the, the, uh, the uh, latest things that we, are, that we are doing and developing. The reason why we decided to uh, embark on this development is driven mainly by energy issues. On one side, looking to uh, explore new energy sources. On the other side, uh, looking to how to deal with the, the, the waste produced by uh, again, energy production from, uh, um, from uh, nuclear, nuclear plants. And what we are now doing here in our formulation, first of all, um, <clears throat> where we left it before having displacements and poor pressures at our nodes, we now need to add a temperature as another variable. And this obviously represents the thermal part of the soil behavior. But this one is really nasty one because it affects both of the previous two. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, affecting one and not the other. And uh, when you put all of this together, which uh, took the good part of the past uh, um, four years, we now have this system of equations with, uh, with uh, uh, this now number of nanons increasing to three and with different parts of the, of the, of the formulation appearing there, uh, most notably um, thermal expansion uh, that, uh, that uh, um, is common for all the materials. Then we have, oops, sorry. Then we have some uh, um, uh, form parts of the formulation that have to do with the conduction and convection in the soil. So um, we have water there, and water flow, and then uh, the um, heat capacity of the soil heat content, and then all the boundary conditions that need to go with it. So what I'm going to do now is to uh, just uh, take a hypothetical case of, uh, um, sorry, before I do that, just to talk about the, the um, um, uh, a particular uh, aspect of uh, thermal uh, behavior that, uh, uh, that I'm going to consider here are the thermal active structures. And these thermoactive structures have a role to provide stability as support systems and also provide energy as uh, uh, ground source heat exchangers. 
And here is just a schematic view of how this may work on an example of a tunnel. Uh, where essentially, a tunnel lining is meant to have some uh, pipes which are filled with uh, uh, this heat exchange fluid. And these pipes are then connected to uh, a building on the ground surface. And the, the philosophy behind it, the, the, the whole mechanism of this working is that in the summer, when the outside temperature is, is, is uh, when it's hot outside, uh, the, the heat from the building is correct, collected and passed down to, uh, uh, this, through these pipes into the tunnel lining. Uh, it obviously heats the tunnel. Um, uh, the temperature is higher than the temperature of the soil. The soil will absorb the extra heat. Um, uh, it will cool the, uh, the, the liquid in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the pipes and will send back the cool liquid into the building to cool the building. Whereas in the winter, uh, because it's cold outside, uh, then the, the cold uh, fluid is passed into, into this uh, into tunnel lining. It's also cooled further to about zero degrees. The ground is now warmer, so it warms the, the liquid and sends back up to the, to the, to the, to the building uh, a, warmer, uh, uh, a warmer liquid to, to heat up the building. And these are examples of how uh, these, I mean, these are just simple pipes filled, filled up with this liquid uh, here for a, for a pile foundation attached to the um, uh, reinforcement cage. Uh, which is then going to be uh, concreted, and the end of the pipes is then uh, um, uh, connected to, to the building. Or in a diaphragm wall construction, similarly, these pipes uh, connected to the cage and then connected to the building at the other end. So our numerical analysis is going to look at a thermoactive tunnel. As I said, this is a hypothetical case, or half hypothetical case, because we're going to take a real tunnel something that we have analyzed years ago when the uh, Jubilee Line extension tunnels were constructed, and we were, when we were only uh, worried at that time about uh, hydromechanical behavior and the tunneling-induced ground movements and what the likely damage uh, uh, those movements can cause to, to the structure. Uh, and then, I will then, at the end of that construction, I will add its thermal part. So here, this, uh, this particular site of the Jubilee Line extension tunnels is uh, actually close to our institution of civil engineers. The tunnels here pass under this uh, treasury building and then go into St. James's Park uh, Greenfield site. And uh, um, uh, Jamie Standing had his monitoring uh, section here in the treasury building and in the St. James's Park where he was uh, monitoring ground movements uh, um, due to tunneling. And if we look at the cross-section through the site, so what we have is on the ground surface we have treasury building and then we have these two tunnels. Uh, one is 34 meters deep, the other 24 meters deep, and they're both excavated in London clay. So, <coughs> uh, just another uh, a snapshot aerial view of the, of the treasury building, just to again to point out this is where the roughly where the tunnels have come underneath, and uh, this is the St. James's Park um, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the side. So our finite element model, we developed here with taking account of various soil layers. And uh, um, I'm just going now to take this middle bit to uh, explain what we are doing to this, uh, to this uh, analysis. Uh, we are simulating the whole construction sequence on the site because uh, there was uh, 100 years uh, before, that, before the tunnels, the treasury was constructed, therefore changing the stresses in the ground. So we are first going to, uh, so in the 1900s, uh, simulate the excavation for the, for the uh, basement of the treasury building. We're then going to construct the, the slab of the, uh, of the, of the uh, treasury and we are going to simulate the building load by applying so the stress boundary condition uh, to uh, simulate uh, what is there at present. And then we have 100 years rest period. So this is the hydro part now happening in our analysis, allowing excess pore pressures to dissipate. And we then come in 1996 and we excavate first the westbound tunnel. And then we have a pause period for eight months again and we excavate the eastbound tunnel. 
So that is how far we, we, we were doing our analysis when we were, when we were originally worrying about the movements. So now uh, we're going to add the thermal part. What if these tunnel linings were thermal active because treasury building may want it to, to, to be heated in that way? So now we have to first activate the thermal boundary conditions, and there are a few of these to worry about. We need to initiate the temperature profile in the soil domain. And we hypothetically sort of thought, well, if the last tunnel was excavated in October 96, we give sort of six months for everything to finish, and then these uh, tunnels become to start to work. And from March 1997, we have these uh, 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 thermoactive uh, uh, tunnel linings. So this we have done by uh, adopting this uh, temperature profile in the soil with depth. Um, the uh, records show that the average temperature uh, in London, in, sorry, sorry, in, in, uh, in the ground in London, actually at Heathrow, is about 12 degrees, and that is constant. And obviously, it varies with, uh, uh, on the ground surface, because in March, it apparently appears to start at about 6 degrees. We then have to uh, uh, annually vary the temperature on the ground surface. Uh, and that the records from Met Office show that uh, uh, over about 30 years uh, show that the so maximum temperature in the summer is about 18 degrees. Uh, it is most summers, but it gets hotter some other summers. So this is what we are going to be applying on the ground surface between March uh, 97 uh, and then annually uh, cycling this. And we also then need this annual variation of temperature um, in our tunnel linings in this heat exchange uh, system. So what is going to happen here, uh, remember, uh, it's the opposite of what the intuition may say. So in the summer, now in the summer period between March and September, we are collecting the heat and passing it into a tunnel. So the tunnel gets heated. And let's say we heat it up to 40 degrees. And then in the winter, uh, the, so the, the cold energy is, is passed uh, pass to the tunnel, and it gets cooled down to, uh, or tunnel lining gets cooled to, down to zero degrees. So I'm going to show just some snapshots of the temperature changes first in the soil that uh, may be uh, um, uh, uh, generated uh, due to these uh, um, thermal conditions. And we've chosen here to do it over a period of five years, to so have these cycles over a period of five years. So initial temperature in March 97, about 5, 6 degrees on the ground surface, and then with some gradient down here going to about 12 degrees, which is constant in the soil. We then have a first cycle uh, from March to August 1997, first cycle of heating. Uh, we see here, obviously, tunnels are now, tunnel linings are red hot. A uh, very sharp gradient of temperature reduction outside the tunnels, but it does generate a zone of uh, sort of increased temperature uh, by about uh, two degrees. Then we have the, the cycle of cooling from uh, August 97 or September 97 to March 98. Tunnels are now blue, or tunnel linings are blue, and they're being uh, uh, cooled. And we see that this uh, area of the, of the change temperature around tunnels has increased slightly. Then we have a second year of cycling, which I've jumped over. So this is a third year of cycling now. Again, heating and then cooling. So this zone of, of change temperature seems to increase. And then finally, we go straight to the end of the five, fifth cycle. Uh, again, we have uh, uh, heating and cooling. So over this five-year cycling, the uh, temperature, um, uh, uh, this, the, um, we have this zone around tunnels, which seems to have gradually increased of uh, 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 temperature change that is uh, two degrees and then some very tight uh, contours towards the tunnels. What is important here uh, to see is what effect this, effect this has on a, on a, on a structure, structural components. Uh, and again, I'm just for brevity going just to show what is happening to, to, to tunnels, to tunnel linings. 
because that is usually, when you talk to London Underground, they're always worried about their assets and tunnels are their, their main assets. And let's just look here, what is happening over one year term of cycle since the end of construction. Now, as we are applying these temperature changes, clearly the soil continues to deform, so the hydro phase continues. It is affected by temperature, but there is still dissipation of excess pore pressures. So as a comparison on the left-hand side, I will uh, show what is happening to these tunnel linings only due to uh, consolidation, so due to a, a hydraulic phase uh, being active in a normal uh, analysis. And then on the right-hand side, what is happening to uh, um, when we have both the consolidation and temperature variation. So here on the left-hand side, in the first half year, the tunnels settle gradually, which one would expect because uh, it is all consolidating. But um, if you have tunnels heated in that uh, first uh, half a year in, in the heating cycle, we see so this deformation of the tunnel linings. And to just finish that here, uh, in sort of normal, due to consolidation, everything still goes down, whereas uh, we have now this um, uh, deformed shape of tunnels after the cooling period after that one year. And normally, when we talk, for tunnel linings, we, we express, if you want to look at the distortions and whether these distortions are dangerous or not, we usually look at the change of diameter between the invert and, the, and sorry, between the crown and the invert and along the spring line. And I will just now summarize that for the whole five-year cycle, uh, looking just at the change of the, of the diameter between the crown and the invert. Uh, for the eastbound tunnel first, uh, if we have only consolidation, then we have sort of gradual reduction of that diameter over a five-year period, uh, amounting to about one millimeter. But if we have, um, if we have the, the, the thermal cycle, so uh, each year has heating and, and cooling, um, we see that this uh, tunnel lining is essentially expanding and contracting all the time. And so does the, the westbound tunnel. So what is the implication of all of this? What is the significance of these results? You've seen here I have no comparison with, with, with any measurements. And the reason is that really we could do with having some uh, field monitoring of these thermoactive structures and surrounding soil so that we can uh, understand better and, and validate our analysis. We certainly need to understand better soil response to temperature cycles um, for our uh, constitutive modeling. And for that, we need, obviously, specialist laboratory equipment. At, at Imperial, certainly, we are dealing with the first two because we, we have done, uh, insti uh, over the past three years, we have uh, instigated a lot of development in uh, laboratory equipment. With our first temperature-controlled triaxial apparatus, uh, where in this, inside of this steel cell, this is the, the sample that, that, that we have uh, normally inside. And uh, uh, the, the temperature in this sample is controlled via the heaters that are placed at the uh, uh, bottom and top pedestals of this cell. And we have uh, sort of integrated the design of, of this apparatus by using our numerical uh, um, uh, developments to try to understand, while we were all in at the, at the initial stage of development, the thermal performance of the apparatus. So what would be the temperature field if only the, the bottom heaters are active and so on uh, until we decided what to, what to do with, with, uh, with this apparatus. We have another uh, uh, um, a design that is using slightly different um, uh, heating system or temperature control system for the same so triaxial cell and triaxial apparatus, but where now we have external jacket with a fluid around it with water that is heating or cooling the whole system because we want to benchmark the two against each other and try to understand which, which one is uh, easier and uh, uh, more efficient to develop. We clearly need to understand the, uh, both thermal and hydraulic conductivity of the soil, and that is why we are developing this, this uh, uh, cell which sort of doubles up uh, into a um, con um, sorry, thermal conductivity cell if we pass the temperature gradient to the sample uh, or becomes a, um, a hydraulic conductivity cell 
if we pass a water gradient through the sample. And we also have a temperature controlled odometer. And we have started to test the soil, obviously land and clay, that, that will be our, our primary interest, albeit reconstituted to start with, uh, but uh, uh, we need to establish the pre framework before we, we start to, to, to play with the, with the natural samples. And we see, uh, just to give you a flavor of what may happen, because this is in no matter completed, we are comparing here uh, a stress path and a stress strain curve for a, a sample that had no temperature exposure, so it tested in a normal way, uh, compressed to about 400 kPa uh, at ambient temperature of the laboratory, 21 degrees, and then brought to failure. And the second sample that, uh, before being loaded to failure, it had a thermal cycle of uh, starting from 20 degrees, warmed up to 80, and then cooled back down to 20 degrees. And apparently there are differences. But we now need to understand the implications of these differences, and in particular, uh, uh, doing this over, over a number of cycles to, to uh, be applicable to things that we want to investigate uh, in the future. So some final remarks, uh, really very briefly. Where are we now, and what are our future challenges? Well, we have developed both the software and the expertise to enable us to analyze most of the contemporary geotechnical problems. And where the future challenges are going to be, they're certainly going to lie into issues related to climate change, searches for new energy sources, waste disposal, uh, life cycle of, of, of structures, and so on. And uh, I think, I firmly believe that our approach that we have had so far with this interaction of uh, laboratory, numerical, and field research um, is going to be even more important uh, because we are going into, into the areas where we really don't know how the soil is going to react to, to, some, of these, to some of these effects. So I thank you all again for coming here this afternoon. The final slide is really to acknowledge um, all my colleagues, past and present, at uh, Imperial the Geotechnic section, um, some PhD students. Um, I've been very fortunate to have some exceptional PhD students, some of whom have appeared here. Their names have appeared in these various um, developments because you need really capable people to undertake such developments. Um, colleagues at GCG, and in particular the numerical team, various research sponsors, and friends and family. Thank you.